All righty. So good afternoon, everyone. How y'all feeling? Good? All right. Hopefully everybody is feeling refreshed. You've had food, you've had coffee, and between me and 30 more minutes is more coffee. So I am delighted and honored to be here today among such an established and diverse group of data science practitioners. I can tell you that I have been in many audiences where the diversity and abilities of the group is not as varied as here today. And it's especially of note that this is the beginning of International Women's Week. And so give yourselves a round of applause. We're just getting started. So I'm here today to talk to you about what does it mean to do data science in the cloud, right? Over the past six years that I've been at Intuit, I've gone through and seen us through our entire end-to-end -end cloud migration journey. And there are some things that I wish that I knew at the beginning, during, and even at the end that I hope to share with you today. And as we mentioned, I was a national physicist in a previous life, so what the heck am I doing at Intuit? So I can tell you that, hmm, this is not working. Give me one second. There it is. All right. So at the start of my PhD, for the first time in my life, I had no money at the end of the month, and I didn't know why. Right? For the first time, I had a salary, which was awesome. I'm making money. But I had bills to pay. I had a car payment. I had all of these things. And I didn't know where my money was going. And if you've been through the US educational system, no one teaches you how to create a budget at all. And so I was at a loss, right? Um, but the only thing I knew how to do was open up Google and I typed in budget tracker and mint.com came up. And I can tell you it was love at first sight when I first signed up to mint. It automatically connected to my bank account, it pulled in my transactions, it uh, made predictions and put those transactions into approximately the right category. Note the approximate part because I'm gonna get back to it. And I actually got to see my budget and I'll tell you, spoiler alert, a lot of it went to restaurants. I love to eat out, and it was really biting me in the bum back then. So second month, I log back in, take a look at my budget again. This is the beginning of the month. I'm trying to be proactive, and what do I see? Some of the things that I spent time correcting before were put back in the wrong categories yet again. And this began to annoy me a little bit. Third month, I log in, same thing. And it felt like everything I was doing was going into a black hole. If you can imagine being an actual physicist, you go to work, you see a black hole, you go home, you see a black hole. It was not awesome. And so I really fell out of love with Mint, right? I abandoned the product. And I said, this is too much work. It wasn't getting smarter. I'm doing all this work already. So I wrote a script to pull the CSV from my bank and made my own budget. Couple years down the line, I'm on the job market now. I'm transitioning out of astrophysics into data science. And a good friend of mine said, hey, you should consider Intuit. I think you'd really like the work that they do there. And so I racked my brain. and I was thinking, Intuit, Intuit, how do I know Intuit? So again, I went back to Google, pulled it up, and said, oh, they made Mint, which is not super awesome. Right? I had really bad <laughs> memories. And so I said, OK, well, I'll go for the interview. Why the heck not? And when I went there, some of the people I met really changed my mind. For a company that's been around for 30 years, Intuit was at the beginning of a transformation in how to leverage all the data that our customers give us to build better products. And the future of the company was to moving towards this revolution that AI is going to help us drive towards. And I asked them a simple question. I said, if I came to Intuit, can I fix Mint? They said, yes. I said, cool, sign me up. And so I've been at Intuit for the past six years now. And six years is a really long time in the valley. Right? So I know our products inside and out. But for those of you who are not as familiar with Intuit as I am, we're the makers of TurboTax, in addition to my favorite Mint, as well as QuickBooks. And we serve our small businesses, consumers, and self-employed with a mission to power prosperity around the world via an AI-driven expert platform. And if you can imagine, that's an extremely lofty goal. And for me, it's a personal mission to be able to leverage my skill set to help our customers. And this message actually resonates with me quite a bit, because at Intuit, my job is to lead the applied machine learning team to build better products for our small business customers. And why do small businesses matter to me so much? Other thing you need to know about me is I come from a family of 11 children. I am the youngest in that family. That's me in orange. Last time in my life I'll ever be able to wear orange, so feast your eyes on it. 
But what's unique about my family is that half of my siblings are small business owners. And one of the statistics that you'll hear that's often cited is that half of all small businesses fail within the first five years. Being a good statistician, that means 2.5 of my siblings are gonna go out of business. <laughs> and so to me, it's really a personal mission to be able to apply my skill set and build better products for our customers so that they go beyond surviving to thriving and then prospering in the future. But it's a very complicated problem to solve. Right? Personal finance is something that flummoxed me as a PhD student. When you add in the complexity of a small business, all of the things they have to worry about, can I make payroll? Do I have enough cash flow? Can I pay my bills? And this is a problem that doesn't really go away just simply because you have a lot of data. And you can't do this on your laptop. You need massive amounts of compute. And that's why about six years ago as a company, we declared that we were going to move into the cloud and begin this transformation. Now, for me, as someone who just joined, I didn't really know the reality of the situation. You think you snap your finger and boom, you're in the cloud, I'm done. But it's actually a really long journey, right? Because the reality of the situation is that you're moving from working on your laptop or an on-premise data center to completely changing your workflow in the cloud. And you don't just move your data, you move your applications, you move your services, and you need to make sure that the cloud environment you're in is fully secure as well. And so what I want to share with you are some of the lessons that I personally learned as well as what my team learned when we went through this cloud migration journey over the past six years. And I hope that regardless of where, the, where you are in your journey, you find this useful. So I think the top question on everyone's mind is how do you choose from all the options? Right? At this point, cloud adoption is mainstream and the competition is fierce. These are the top six cloud providers. Two years ago, there were only three major cloud providers, and every year there's a new entrant into the market. And if you take a look at what these cloud providers offer, it's really hard to distinguish. They offer a whole bunch of stuff, right? But why do you, as a data scientist, need to care which cloud provider your institution goes to? Because regardless of whether or not you're in academia, industry, healthcare, finance, you are going to move to the cloud. Stanford University is moving itself to the cloud as we speak right now. And so my position is as a data scientist, the reason why you need to care about which cloud provider and what they offer is because of the AI services these cloud providers are increasingly releasing, right? And this is where differentiation happens. Here are just some of the major services that these cloud providers offer speech to text transcription, machine translation, natural language processing, conversational agents. And for me, I didn't really appreciate the fact that these AI services can actually make a difference in how quickly you can ship a product until I myself went through it. About two and a half years ago, we were looking to build a chatbot to be placed in our TurboTax product. Because I can tell you, people don't like doing taxes, but people really hate calling in for help. Right? No one loves picking up the phone and saying, hey, Comcast, fix my internet. And so what we wanted to do was actually build in a help agent in our products that can come up and help our customers resolve their issues without needing to call in. But in order to do this, we needed to have a conversational agent capability, a natural language understanding service that was scalable, extensible, and was highly accurate. And if you remember, we're a financial services company. And so we don't have this expertise. So what we did was we went through and said, do we build this or do we buy it? And when we went through and looked at all the different cloud providers, we realized actually they each provided something that was very much battle tested, had been in production for other companies. And we ended up using one from one of the major providers and that actually helped us leapfrog ourselves multiple years. We were able to deliver a chat agent into TurboTax within just a couple months and build on top of it. And so what I really think you um, should come away from this section understanding is that it really doesn't have to be one cloud fits all. Regardless of which cloud provider your organization is in, take a look at the AI services that other cloud providers are offering because it really could actually expand your data science team beyond what it could do right now. 
and construct the best solution for your organization as you go along and use these services. Second thing for me that was actually really difficult was embracing a new workflow. I thought I had already been at the forefront of uh, working in a new way. Right? Everything was done in a virtual machine. I fully specified my dev environment. If my laptop crashed, I could bring it up within the same day. And so for me, when I thought about moving to the cloud, it would be I would drop my laptop into the cloud and I would just go on with my day. But if you start with working in a laptop environment, it's actually fairly limiting and you're not leveraging the full power that the cloud can offer. Because if the instance type that you're on runs out of memory, you should be able to automatically pull up a couple more nodes, distribute your workflow across that, and then send your job out. And that's not something you can do on a laptop. Right? No matter if you're already using virtual machines right now on your laptop, you cannot do that auto scaling. And so you need to move to a cloud native tech stack. And so for me, the difference was when we moved to containers, that allowed us to just build our code, write our systems much more cleanly. That actually allowed for better collaboration as well because it did not depend on the dev environment you're in. I could send my container file to a coworker and they can specify their dev environments on their machines and run the same code yet again. And not just that, it allowed you to scale. And so if you can imagine, right, you run out of compute and you need more memory. If you're already working in a cloud native stack, you can spawn your job across 100 nodes and get that done at the same time via Kubernetes without changing anything about your configuration. And that's where the real power lies in the cloud. And once we got to that point, it actually opened up a new door for us to be able to solve a problem that we didn't think we could solve previously. Now, if you know anything about small businesses, it's that every single small business is unique, just like every single individual is unique. And so when you want to solve the cash flow problem for small businesses and build out time series, you can't aggregate all of their data, build out one time series, and then apply it to everyone and say, here you go, good to go. It simply cannot be done. And so if you want to solve the cash flow problem for small businesses, you need to be able to build an individual time series at runtime for every single small businesses. And when you have four million customers, that need means you need to build four million simultaneous cash flow or time series uh, algorithms and then ship that out within a certain limitation. And when I was working on my laptop, I can tell you, when I pulled in 100,000 transactions, it killed over and died. I have to get a new one. And so when you think about a billion transactions for four million customers, that's a scale that is just unimaginable. And it wasn't until we moved into the cloud, changed the way we did our work, that we could actually think about distributed training, right? A lot of us, especially me, think about distributed computation for just crunching your data in preparation for machine learning. But what I recommend you think about are how to actually distribute your training job so that you can start moving to the era of building personalized models for every single one of your users because it is possible now and it's only possible if you move to a cloud native tech stack because the scaling that comes with it requires minimal code changes. And so this is just a simplified architecture diagram of how we distribute our four million time series across our billion transactions and partition it into multiple jobs utilizing every single core within our 100 node cluster. And all of this is done with the same container file. No changes on that end. And that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. So I've talked about which cloud to choose and how to change your workflow. But for me, changing my mindset took a really long time. So I lead an applied machine learning team. So it's not just about me changing how I thought about costs and how I thought about where my job was. It's imbuing that within my organization and getting my team to change as well. And so I think a lot of us are familiar with Costco. It's where you buy in bulk. And the analogy here is that when we think about computation, in the old world, we buy computation in bulk, right? You go and you pay some data center some amount of money and say, I'm going to own these machines for the next three years. If you use all of it, great. If you don't use it, doesn't matter. It's use it or lose it. And that's a classical argument for why you should move to the cloud. Because on the cloud, you just pay for what you use. 
And for me, in my everyday life, when I go to the store, I look at the price per ounce. I don't look at the whole unit, right? And so I've been trained in my personal life to think of that. But bridging that gap when we moved into our cloud provider and working in this way was inordinately difficult to do. And so why was that? And that's because for a lot of us, um, it's just those neural pathways. You're trained to think about price per unit in one way, and you don't think about it in your professional environment. You've never had to do that before. And the one example that really sticks out to me that I think about often, and I actually think about this almost every single day, was going back to the Mint transaction categorization problem. By this point, we had already trained a new model. We'd shipped it out into production, but we were looking for slight performance gains. And about three years ago is when we said, okay, let's take a look at some of the new deep learning architectures. We said, let's take two million transactions, put that through a convolutional neural net, and see what we get. Do we get the performance gains we're looking for? That took three days. And in those three days, I went to get coffee, I read some research papers, I twiddled my thumbs, I opened the terminal to take a look at it to see when it was done. Right? That took a significant amount of time. And that was something that was widely accepted at that time as normal. When we moved into the cloud, do you know how long that same job took? It took one hour. And that was because we could use the right machines and we can scale to the right GPU instance. And so that made me rethink my approach and think, actually, you should really move to a decisions per minute framework rather than thinking about price per node, right? That's a factor of two boost in decisions. Within one hour, we could say, is this the right thing for us to do and move on? And the last point that I just want to touch on, I know Margot is going to pull me off the stage too, um, is something that Daphne touched on. Right? You've heard me say a couple of things about working as a cloud native data scientist using containers, using Kubernetes. Why do you as a data scientist need to care about that? And my position is that it makes us all better data scientists if we understand the end-to-end -end flow and get involved in not just the engineering aspect, but how do our results show up to our users? We could not have pushed our engineering team to build distributed training for us if we didn't say that this is the only way that we can solve that customer problem for cash flow. And so I really highly recommend that you don't think of yourself as someone to build algorithms and throw it over the wall. Be involved in the whole process. And so because of uh, being in the cloud, utilizing the AI services that exist, changing our workflow to be cloud native, um, we were able to solve some very difficult customer problems that are live today in the product and were unimaginable to me when I started six years ago to be able to solve. And so regardless of whether you are at the beginning, middle, or at the end of your journey, I hope some of these things have been helpful to you. It's been an honor and a privilege to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much.